Today we celebrate the feast of Christ the King, a relatively recent addition to our liturgical calendar. This feast originated in the Roman Catholic Church in 1925 and made it onto our calendar only in 1970. This feast is awkward for a couple of reasons. Most of the feasts on the liturgical calendar are celebrations of the saints or of key moments in salvation history, like the Nativity and the Resurrection of Jesus. All great triumphs in one way or another. But the Feast of Christ the King was instituted as something of a defensive move, an anxious response to decreasing religious observance in much of the Western world, though it also conveniently closes out the liturgical year, setting the stage for Advent, rather than having us crash straight into it from ordinary time. The other reason the Feast of Christ the King is awkward is our ambivalence, at best, toward monarchy. On the one hand, many Americans are fascinated by the British royal family, went to great lengths to watch the recent royal weddings, and the idea of having a noble counterweight to vulgar partisan politics holds some appeal especially when your party is out of power. The tale of American independence is enduringly popular, though every four years quite a lot of Americans threaten to move to Canada, which is technically a monarchy. I've looked into it myself, and it turns out Canada can get along without us just fine. On the other hand, some people find the very word king to be so problematic or imagine other people have a problem with it, that they insist on referring to this feast as the reign of Christ instead. One problem with that term is that it turns attention away from the person of Jesus, Jesus whom we know a bit about and with whom we can have a relationship, and turns our attention to a nebulous time or place or state, it's never quite clear what this reign refers to. But I get the impulse. The world certainly has produced some terrible kings and many mediocre ones. But to change the name of the feast is to miss the point that was abundantly clear to people who knew the realities of life under capricious and unaccountable despots. Well-meaning Christians today may wring their hands over this terminology, forgetting that in the age in which our faith was born, to proclaim Christ as king or the more ancient declaration of faithful discipleship, Jesus is Lord, was a radical declaration. Saying these things was to say that Caesar and Herod were not your king, that Pilate was not your Lord. That's why saying such things could get you killed. We may be thankful that such is no longer the way of things, and that, at least in the West, the monarchs who do remain are all Christians anyway, so no problem. We have the comfort and peace, therefore, in which to dig a bit deeper and to continue the deconstruction of the very concept of royalty that Jesus initiated by saying, if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. This is tricky. Jesus more or less directly states that he is a king since by definition that's the only kind of person who has a kingdom. But a king, at least in his day, was by definition not someone you could choose to follow or not. Technically, the Vatican is now an elective monarchy, but that's another story for another day. In Jesus' day, you didn't choose your king. Kings usually were born. Sometimes they made themselves by conquest or usurpation. Occasionally, they were made, or rather appointed, by an emperor like Herod was. But Jesus speaks of those who chose to follow him, 
rather than making a claim to conventional royal authority. He also says his kingdom is not from here. In those days, a kingdom, by definition, was a geographical territory. So does that mean we get to choose whether Jesus is our king? Does that mean his kingdom is strictly ephemeral and perhaps subjective? Well, no and no. Earlier in John's Gospel, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Jesus is divine, and so he is the one of whom St. John the Divine had a vision coming on the clouds, the one who made us to be a kingdom, the one who rules over everything from A to Z or from Alpha to Omega, depending on what language you speak. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus' kingdom is also very tangible, for it encompasses all of creation. Like earthly kings, he doesn't need our permission to rule us. But his rule is a rule of love, not coercion. Earthly kings hold power of life and death over their subjects, at least in theory. And the kings of Jesus' day didn't hesitate to use that power to keep their kingdoms in line. Jesus knew this intimately, for he bore the punishment of death for our sake. For a mere mortal, this would have been a dramatic show of principle, but because Jesus is also fully divine, the consequences of his sacrifice are not limited to him or to his day, but rather they represent a change in the relationship between God and humanity. So his sacrifice was not just a statement, but an act of profound love and the inauguration of a radically new form of kingship. And quite unlike earthly kings, Jesus does allow us to follow him or not, though he has the full authority to, to demand our obedience. He does not stoop to the level of earthly tyrants whose Insistence on coercion is evidence of their insecurity and, in the end, of their illegitimacy. For Jesus, the true king, love and grace are more than sufficient. For our part, we choose to follow him not because of what might happen to us if we don't, but because of what Jesus definitely did do for us. Ultimately, we follow Jesus because of who he is. When we do choose to follow him, we rediscover that whom we choose to follow, or what we choose to follow, is a big part of who we are. Most of us don't think much about whom or what they will follow, let alone the consequences of that choice. And yet, it is human nature to follow someone or something, whether it's a, an individual or a faction or our own money or fame or ambition. If you think about it just for a second, you realize that of course, whatever we choose to follow or pursue determines our outcome. The results of this choice is always utterly predictable. The result of our following Christ, our King, is especially predictable. For in this one case, there's no guesswork at all. This feast may have begun in anxiety, but that's something we all have to deal with. And so it is always relevant to our lives. Likewise, there is no better cure for our fears than the reality of Jesus' kingship. Scripture tells us over and over that Jesus' love and grace will be made perfect in us. And by the power of that love and grace, we will live with him in joy forever in his heavenly kingdom. Amen.